5, Jeremiah chapter 5. Remember this morning we um, talked about the theme is going to be for the next few services on revival. On revival, where was we at this morning? Ezra. 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 We're in Jeremiah tonight. Jeremiah tonight. And um, the Bible says here in Jeremiah chapter number 6. Jeremiah 6. Is everyone there? Jeremiah 6. And you know this verse. Verse 16. Thus saith the Lord, Stand ye in the ways and see, and ask for the old paths, where is the good way, and walk therein, and ye shall find rest for your souls. But they said, We will not walk therein. All right, now, what had happened? This, is now, this morning we talked about the post captive. Those that came out of the land of Babylon went back to Israel. Uh, and then that was uh, brother, what Brother Paul was talking about, about Media Persian decree. Cyrus had actually given them a decree to come back. And then Artaxerxes is when Nehemiah came back. But nevertheless, go to Jeremiah 5. Jeremiah 5. Jeremiah chapter number 5. The Bible says in verse number 1, Run ye to and fro through the streets of Jerusalem, and see now and know and seek in the broad places thereof, if you can find a man. If there be any that executeth judgment, that seeketh truth, the truth, and I will pardon it. Verse 7 says, How shall I pardon thee for this? Thy children have forsaken me and sworn by them that are no gods when I had fed them to the full. They then committed adultery and assembled themselves by troops in the harlots' houses. Verse 9, Shall I not visit for these things, saith the Lord, and shall not my soul be avenged on such a nation as this? And I'm just skimming through there. Look at verse 12. They have belied the Lord. They've lied to the Lord. That's what belied me. They've just lied to the Lord and said, It is not he, neither shall evil come upon us, neither shall we see sword nor famine. Verse 14, Wherefore thus saith the Lord God of hosts, because you speak this word, behold, I will make my words in thy mouth fire, and this people would, and it shall devour them. Judgment's coming. Judgment's coming on the house of God. Judgment's coming on Israel. Or actually here is Judah uh, in Jeremiah. And he says, I'll bring a nation upon you from far, O house of Israel. Verse 15. And um, look at verse 21 of that same chapter. Hear now this, O foolish people, and without understanding, which have eyes and see not, which have ears, and hear not. Now that's, of course, Isaiah said that, and it's repeated again in the Gospels, and also in the book of Romans. A lot of people have ears and eyes, but they're really not listening. Now here we're talking to children of God. The children of God have ears and eyes, and they still go to sleep on the Lord. Awake, awake out of sleep, it's high time to serve the Lord, is what the Bible says. And... Um, and then if we go on and the Bible says in verse 31 of that same chapter, chapter 5, the prophets prophesy falsely and the priests bear rule by their means and my people love to have it so. My people like it like this. They don't want to be upset with the truth. And what will you do in the end thereof? Well, I've had many messages out of Jeremiah chapter number 5. But anyway, in Jeremiah chapter 6 and verse 6, for thus hath the Lord of hosts said, Hew ye down trees and cast them out against Jerusalem. This is a city to be visited. In chapter 5, it talks about making a visit. A visit is the judgment of the Lord. This city is going to be visited. She is, holy, um, she is holy oppression in the midst of her. Now, we find out in the chapter number 6, in the first eight verses, we have a... Um, a city that is forewarned. Did you know America is forewarned? All, yes, that's exactly right. All through the Word of God, the Bible talks about all the warning. Before judgment ever falls, before uh, a man begins to reap what he sows, a warning goes. If you'll look at every prophet, they came in with warning. God's not just going to spring it on you. He's not going to do it. There's a warning. Brother Scott just talked about um, a nation turning their back on God and teaching our precious little babies over here. I say little babies. You know, as old as I am, you call everybody a baby that's uh, 40 and below. So uh, anyway, these precious babies over here, you know, they, they grew up here. In Remember, was you here Wednesday night when I talked about TCAP? And everybody, and everybody said, no, that's not what you call it. That's what you call it in Tennessee, TCAP. T-C-A-P. TCAP. I got it right here. That's an achievement test practice. Achievement test practice is recent. And, and in order to graduate... From the sixth grade, 
this is what you have to know. And it gives you an achievement test. Now, this is, this is Tennessee. I don't know what Florida holds. Maybe parents, if you have kids going to a public school, you sure need to get a hold of whatever Florida calls it. HEPCAP? FCAP. Okay. HEPCAP. I don't know. Okay. Anyway, it says, um, dur this is, um, this is, uh, uh, McDougal Little is a publisher, but it's world history. World history. In your public school system right today up in Tennessee, up there, and this is, um, it's a state performance indicator. How well are you performing in school in world history? Recognize the world's major religions and their founders. That is, this is a good, you know, we teach that in Bible college, world religions. It says, recognize the world's major religions and their founders. That is Judaism, Christianity, Islam, Buddhism, Hinduism, Moses, Jesus, and Mohammed. Recognize these names and everything. Now, it tells you to recognize Christianity and Judaism and the other ones, but it gives you four pages. It doesn't give you any on Christianity. But it gives you four pages on the Islamic faith. It's <laughs> well, it, it's it's uh, yeah, well, it's devil sanctioned. I know that. But anyway, it says um, the, it tells you got to know the life of Mohammed. It gives the dates, the Islamic faith, Islam's relation, Islam's relation to Judaism and Christianity, and then it gives you a page. Now, this is your TCAP to to pass from the sixth grade into the seventh grade. And it gives you, right here on the next page, in what, now this is, why does ch school kids have to know this? In what order did significant events in Mohammed's life, as shown in the box, occur? And then it gives you multiple listing. Number two, Mohammed's followers were called Muslims because they, A, B, C, or D. What happened after the, what do you call that, high... Uh, H-I-J-R-A-H Hira Hira it's a well yeah oh Hira whatever that is Jihad anyway it's it's written to explain what people don't understand in the Quran <laughs> I, was, I didn't know what that was till I read it but I have a book that says what it means and means what it says and explains as it goes amen, amen. what a wonderful book this is well, anyway, it's got a, uh, and then it says, why do Muslims pray in the direction of Mecca? It's got multiple. What are the two important teachings are common to Islam, Judy, and Christianity? What is the relationship among the Torah, the Bible, and the Quran according to Muslims? Not according to Christianity or according to, thus saith the Lord. All right, now that's, um, I mean, you say you're not interested in this. Well, you need to be. You need to be, amen. All right. Um, the Quran and the Sunna? Sunni. Sunni? Well, they need to spell it Sunni then. That's Sunna, man, Tennessee. S U N N A H. Uh, Sunni, the Sunni. The Quran and the Sunni. Um, here's questions now. No questions about Christianity in here. Which statement about the origin of the Quran is correct? A, B, C, or D? What is the attitude of Muslims toward the teaching contained in the Quran? A, B, C, or D? Number three, what is the significance of the Quran to Muslims? Number four, what's the importance of the Sunni? In the quotation, what is the Quran saying about the rights of women? This is in... This is, this is in TCAP, Achievement Test. Check out, if you have kids going to public school in Florida, you need to check out what they believe. This is being taught to our precious babies. Now, not only the Big Bang Theory, but uh, this. They're trying, the whole world's trying to convert, get your, get your eyes off the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, did you know that Jeremiah said there's warning? Anytime you turn your back on God, there's warning. Jerusalem, he said, in verse number six, was a city forewarned. We're forewarned. And uh, in verse number 15 of chapter number six, the Bible said, were they ashamed when they had committed abomination? Nay, they were not at all ashamed. Neither could they blush, therefore shall they fall among them that fall. At that time that I visit them, they shall be cast down, saith the Lord. All right, now not only that, it's a mourning city as well. It's a mourning city, verse um, 
chapter 6, verse 22. I'm not going to read it. Verse 22, 23, 24, 25, and 26. And it's a tried city, according to verse number 9. Did you know America is in the same situation? The days of Jeremiah's ministry to the people of Israel were days of spiritual wickedness. The people had sinned to the point where God was ready to give them into captivity. Give them into captivity. Don't listen to any preacher that said God gives up. God don't give up. God sent his only begotten son to die for those that have given up. Amen. And uh, he shows us through the blood of Christ that we can be made whole again. We talked about this morning there's hope. Remember that in the book of Ezra? We talked about it. There is hope. Who is our hope? Jesus Christ. He is hope. He is the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh from the Father but by him. Jeremiah chapter number 5 and verse number 1 we've already read. Um, the Lord tells Jeremiah to look for a glimmer, just a glimmer of hope so that he can pardon them. Will you, who are called by my name, humble yourselves, seek his face, and turn from your wicked ways, just looking for a glimmer of hope, looking for one that will stand in the gap. You know, we talked about this morning, um, um, we're talking about, um, I'm not going to leave my pea patch, talking about last Sunday, but we mentioned it this morning. And then we talked about some people that just made comments and revival. Was there really a revival? Have I ever really experienced a revival? And I said, yeah, I really have. I, I have. And I think that for the last few years that the Faith Baptist Church has been in a revival. Um, so we had a fellow this morning say that I've dug in. I had a fellow, before he left church this morning, he said, I'm going to go home and get my shovel. Amen. In other words, I'm going to dig in. I'm going, to get, I, I'm, going to, I'm going to dig in. Now, I'm not foolish enough to believe that revival just happened. I'm not. Well, there had to be some things put in order, just like Elijah put some things in order in 1 Kings chapter number 18. Did you know that there was some fallow ground plowed up six years prior to before I got here? I know, I know what Brother Dewey preached. I know that it was turned over and turned over. I know before him, I know what Brother Mike Johnson preached. I, I know there was some fallow ground plowed up. So I'm not foolish enough to believe that just because David Rowan came, and if I gave that uh, if I gave that, um, that image this morning, I, I am sorry. I want to take that back. Nobody's questioned me, but I, got, I went home and I started thinking, well, you know, you, you said revival's been the last five years. I've been here six. That just means that Brother Rowan brought revival. That's foolish to believe something like that. Foolish. The file of ground's been plowed. It's been plowed. You've been hearing it for years. And, and I believe, though, what I've been seeing in the last few years is you acting upon what you've heard. You acting upon truth, a response to the truth of God, that's called faith. And you've been manifesting your faith by actually responding to what you've heard. God has turned over some fallow ground. As a result, we have seen people saved. The Bible college is back up and running. People are being trained to go out and pastor and preach and evangelize. And you're being trained from the pulpit. You got your Bibles with you tonight. That's a blessing for any pastor to see is when you held up those wonderful books right there. I have the Word of God. It is the authorized King James Bible. Amen. It's not your modern day perversions. You say, you're just saying that. No, I'm saying it by conviction. By conviction. It is a conviction that we have the Word of God. We have the pure Word of God. All right, back in Jeremiah chapter number 5 and chapter number 6. In chapter number 6, um, now remember, Israel perched on the edge of judgment, and God's desire for them is to turn back to Him. And I'm sure glad that's still God's desire the Bible tells us that the Lord is not slack in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse number 9. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. In other words, kids, that means that God's not give up on us. Amen? God hadn't give up on me. I'm 61 years old, and I thank God that He didn't give up on me because I didn't even get in church till I was around 26. 26 years old, and then in 1996, which was just yesterday for me, in 1996, I rested in the sufficiency of the Lord Jesus Christ for my salvation. 
He is salvation. You know how I rested in that knowledge or that sufficiency? That's come to a knowledge by preachers getting up preaching the truth, me opening the Bible, reading the Bible, listening to truth, reading truth, and responding to truth. Amen? And the moment I responded to that truth, God imputed to me, and He will impute to you what you need to go to heaven, and that is the righteousness of His dear Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. Is what the Bible says in Romans chapter 10, verse number 4. All right, now we go on. We see uh, here in uh, Jeremiah chapter number 6 and verse number 16 again. Thus saith the Lord, Stand ye in the ways and see, and ask for the old paths, where is the good way, and walk therein, and ye shall find rest for your souls, but they said, we will not walk therein. Here in verse number 16, we're given an image of a traveler who comes to a fork in the road, and he has the opportunity to go any direction that he wants to go. But you know what God tells him to do? God tells him to ask for the old paths, which is the good way. Now, I could reminisce a little bit and ask for the old paths back when... Uh, motors and cars had cubic inches and not liters. And back when there were points and condensers and spark plugs and things like that, I could go back in the old path. But what's he talking about here? He's talking about the old paths, the Word of God. Not just reminiscing our old life, but as for the old paths, that is the doctrine, the truth of the Word of God. Did you know some tradition is good? Bible tradition is good. Did you know that Jesus Christ is God, is Bible doctrine? We believe that Jesus Christ is God. We, we, we believe that Jesus Christ was born of a virgin. He did not have a human father. That's good. Let's stand in the old paths. Do we believe in a, in a uh, sinless life of our Savior, totally God, totally man at the same time? Do we believe that He went to Calvary and there at Calvary God made Him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God? And we believe, sure we do. Do we believe in a vicarious death, a substitutionary death? Do we believe in a bodily resurrection? Nothing wrong with the old paths. Just keep preaching them. Stand in the old paths. That's the same thing that you and I are supposed to do uh, when we come to a dilemma in our lives. Let's not forsake the Lord and just give up. Throw the cloth in. Throw the towel in. Let's stand true. And that's exactly what God wants us to do is to choose the old paths. We're to ask for directions. Where do we find the directions? In the Word of God. Yet some people are just too prideful to ask or to even just, just talk about it, and they choose the wrong road or the wrong path. They'll continue down the wrong path. And you can't walk down any road you choose uh, and not be surprised if it's not the Word of God. Now, if I walk down the path of the Word of God, I know the outcome. I already know it. I know what God's going to do. He's already told me what he was going to do. He's going to give me a glorified body and I'm going to rule and reign with him in the kingdom for a thousand years and I'm going to live with him for eternity. I'm going to be in the new heaven, new earth. I'm going to be in that new Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven. I know those things. So if I choose the right path, I already know those things. I rest in those things as a saved man and I don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow's got enough evil sufficient for the day thereof. I know these things. So I have that peace that passes understanding. But don't be surprised when you choose any road you want to, the, the wrong road. Don't be surprised when you run into trouble or what you run into. Kind of like the cat that chased the squirrel up a tree, sits there in its pitiful condition, meowing. What's the moral of that story? Don't chase squirrels or cats if you can't stand the heights. Amen. Pretty good, isn't it? You stay true to the Word of God. All right, we see the recommendation in, in Jeremiah chapter 6, the requirement or the recommendation, a command that God is issuing to His people for them not to allow themselves to be led astray. Look at verse number 13 and 14. The Bible said, For from the least of them, even to the greatest of them, everyone is given to covetousness, and from the prophet, even unto the priest, everyone dealeth falsely. From the prophet to the priest... Verse 14, they have healed also the hurt of the daughter of my people slightly, saying, peace, peace, when there is no peace. I don't want to bust your bubble, Faith Baptist Church, but the world's not getting any better. It's getting worse. 
it's getting a lot worse. And so in times of trouble, who's our stronghold? Who's our prop? Who do we cast our cares on because he cares for us? The Lord Jesus Christ. So we can get through these terrible tribulational times, as it were. We can get through these times because of Christ. So a command that God's issuing right here in verse number 1 through 16 of chapter number 6 is for his people not to allow themselves to be led astray by the false prophets and the leaders of their day. Just because a man stands, stands behind a pulpit uh, doesn't mean you have to believe everything he says. There was a time in my life I thought that was true. I thought surely he can't call himself a preacher or a teacher and, and tell me anything wrong. Surely he can't do that. Well, I read, um, I read some scripture. Where's it at over there about Satan? Um, is that 2 Corinthians 11? It is, isn't it? 2 Corinthians 11. Look at, look at that if you would, please. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter number 11. Paul already told us in verse number 3 that he feared by lest any means as a serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety. So your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that's in Christ. Um, and then we get to verse number 13 of 2 Corinthians 11. The Bible said, For such are false prophets, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the what? Ministers of righteousness whose end shall be according to their works. And you can see the lost man is judged in Revelation 20 according to his works and then cast in the lake of fire. So um, just because he calls himself a pastor, preacher, or teacher, uh, you know what we have right now to prove every man what, what do you have to prove every man? It's right in front of you. That's why it's so important to always bring your Bibles and always follow along. I go a little fast sometimes on the Scripture. But write them down if you can. Take them home and study them. But always check out the preacher. See if he's telling you what's true. See if he's telling you the truth. We have the Word of God. So the requirement of the recommendation is God is telling His people not to be led astray. Now, they were to look back to men like Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, and walk in the... Remember Abraham chapter, uh, what is it, Romans chapter number 4? Uh, speaking of Abraham, said, walk in the steps of that faith. Walk in the steps of that. What is the faith of Abraham? To believe God. To believe God. He believed God and it was counted... Genesis 15, verse 6, it was counted to him for righteousness. So we walk in the steps of that faith. We believe God. How much faith does God want me to have? How much faith does God want you to have? Just enough to believe what he says. Just enough to believe what he says. So we have faith in God. Now God doesn't force his way upon us, yet he puts all the road signs that we need to the right destination. And he even tells us over in Hebrews chapter number 12 that we're encompassed about with so great a cloud of witness. If they can do it, a Hebrews chapter 11 crowd, then we can do it too. Amen? You and I can stay true. All right. The Bible even says, uh, again, do not be led astray. And let's talk just a second about your salvation. I wonder how many people in here has been led astray, like myself in my early years, about really knowing if you're going to heaven or not. Well, the Bible says this in the 50th Psalm in verse 23, Whosoever offereth praise glorifieth me, and to him that ordereth his conversation aright will I show the salvation of God. You just keep doing what you know to do. What do I know to do? Read my Bible. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. I know a man that spent just, I mean, every day in the Bible here recently, and finally, he had come to a knowledge, he had just come to a realization that what God said is true. I wonder why we have to do that. I was one of them that had to do that. Did you have to do that too? Either one. Had to stay in the Word. You know, I'd been taught so much as a child and, uh, that all I had to do was do this and, or say this or perform this. But there was never that peace that passes understanding in my heart and soul 
So I just kept doing. I listened to some good men with godly instruction and wisdom. And they said, do what you know to do is right. And I said, well, I know to read the Bible is right. I know to go to church. I know to go to church is right. So I went to church. I listened to the preacher and I got my Bible and I read my Bible. I even got my Bible and was telling people about Jesus before I ever got saved. And I just kept doing what was right. And then one day it finally dawned on me that there was nothing I could do. It's already been done on Calvary. The work of redemption has already been wrought and I just rested in the sufficiency of Christ. So that's what we see. We just keep on. Don't be led astray. If you're here lost without Christ, you stay in the Word of God. And I suggest that you stay in the book of John and read it over and over and over. I know one man that can just about quote you the book of John. He stayed in it that long. And finally it dawned on him that Christ Jesus was sufficient. I say it dawned on him. It didn't dawn on him. Amen. You read the word of God and the Holy Spirit does a quickening, doesn't he? Amen. You hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sin. So when you want to know, God will show you. Be careful now of deception. Now, the problem that Israel was facing, or Judah was facing here in the book of um, Jeremiah, the problem they faced is the same that we face today. Confusion and deception. Confusion and deception. Let me give you a little, a little illustration here. You may have heard it before. But during World War II, during the Battle of the Bulge, a group of German soldiers dressed themselves in uniforms of the Allies and they used American military vehicles and went through the German countryside changing the road signs. Changing the road signs. Therefore, some of our troops were fooled and led off into the wrong direction and almost gave Germany the victory. Now, just like the German soldiers who uh, caused the confusion and death by changing the road sign, so many people today are changing the road sign. Did you know if you really want revival, it's still the same way as it used to be? Let's put some things in order and get on your knees and pray and ask God to send the fire. Elijah did and it happened in 1 Kings 18. If my people, which are called by my name, by the way, it's still Bible. You said, that's Old Testament. That's Second Chronicles. He's talking to Judah. Second Chronicles 7, 14 is talking to David Rowan. If my people, which are called by my name, y'all know this verse, say it with me, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then hear from heaven. Pardon, well, say the rest of it. I get confused right there. Amen. That's what he says. All right, where am I going? Romans 1. Romans 1. I'm going to close with this. Romans 1. Romans chapter 1. We're talking about people causing confusion and changing things. And America, I'm sure it's you. Y'all need to go vote this year. And I'm telling you, I don't just get up here just to hear myself talk and say you need to go vote. You need, if you're not registered, you have till October the 11th to do so. And if you don't make a right choice at the polls, and if God doesn't intervene, see, God, God, you know, if this is what the country wants, it's the way the country's going to go. If Christians aren't going to stand in the gap and do what they can do, then, then, then don't be surprised when, when uh, we get a third term of what we got, or worse. Whoever gets in this next time is going to have an opportunity to put on what I call today the corrupt Supreme Court. And it, there's an opportunity that it couldn't be corrupt if we put the right ones on there. Who, whoever gets in is going to have an opportunity to fill their places. And you're going to have, if it's liberal, you're going to have ungodly, Roe versus Wade decisions, ungodly. Miss Kelly, you were talking about the next generation. Those judges sit on there for a lifetime. Our whole next generation are going to have liberal ideas handed down from that corrupt branch. Now, how much does that mean to you? How much does that mean to you? Adults, I've got, you know, my kids are grown. My, my kids, I have spent a, a lifetime teaching my kids about Christ. I've got two little grandbabies right there. and I've got five more grandbabies scattered over the country. And it would, it would kill me to know that 
it would kill me to know that they were putting people on that Supreme Court that was going to hand down rules that we would have to entertain homosexuals and transgenders preachers gonna you know you say this is not never gonna happen in America it's already happening what about preachers giving a mandate to marry homosexuals if asked they're doing it in Canada are y'all listening to me if if you don't if you don't exercise your God-given right, that's what we have in America, our constitutional right, but our God-given right to speak up. To speak up. Exercise your constitutional right and you go to the polls and you vote against nastiness and liberalism. Vote against it. That'll tell you who to vote for, won't it? All right. You... That's exactly right. You want to, amen. We're going to give an invitation after that one. There's a 20 year Navy man, a friend of mine, that's headed a Democratic Society in San Luis Obispo. He's voting for Hillary Clinton. I told him. Martin Sanger, Dan Fairwood. He goes to Pine Chair and Baptist Church. He can call that preacher there and call him to start preaching. His congregation to death where he goes. Hmm. Well, if I open the floor now, we're going to have a big old debate. He's exactly 100% right. How could you refute what he just said? If you don't put out truth, I'm in Romans 1. Are y'all in Romans 1 with me? All right, I'm going to go to Romans 1. I'm going to close. We're talking about changing, changing. Just, just changing the laws. Crying peace when there is no peace. In Romans chapter number 1, verse number 18, the Bible said, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Now, I'm not preaching on Romans 1, but you can go through Romans 1 and you'll see the, uh, how man is... is uh, I don't believe in evolution, but I believe in de-evolution. If you want to... I guess you could say that word. Yeah, yeah, de -evolved. But if you go to verse number 25, it ended up... It ended up, they, first of all, they held the truth in unrighteousness. In verse 25, they changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the Creator who is blessed forever. Amen. All right, they held the truth and they changed the truth. Did you know what we're at the point of here in America? Changing the truth. They're changing the laws. Changing the laws of the land. Uh, I have an illustration on that and I'm going to give it in close. Uh, the, the word... Uh, um, Violation and the word repudiation. Violation versus repudiation. Violation is going down the interstate and what's the speed limit nowadays? 70 miles an hour? Going down the interstate at about 85. And then the blue lights are behind you in your window and your, your heart goes down in your sock because you know you're going to be out about 150, 200 bucks. And then you're, they're going to leave you sitting on the side of the road for an hour. How do you know these things, preacher? <laughs> Amen. Y'all been there, huh? All right. They're going, and, and, and I remember I got pulled over one time. My kids say, why do you keep us here so long? I said, because they can. <laughs> they can. Well, anyway, it just teaches you a lesson. And I deserved it. You know what? I didn't like getting pulled over, and I sure didn't like the ticket I had to pay. But I appreciated the law. I violated, it cost me. You know what repudiation is? Repudiation is me getting out of my car, putting that thing up in park, getting out of it, and getting me a sawzall and cutting that sign down and throwing it in the ditch and putting up my own sign that says 85. You see, that's what America's doing. That's what they're putting up their own signs. And the world's doing it. And uh, do I believe that after a Manasseh, there can be a Josiah? Guarantee it. So there can be. So what you need to start doing is praying for revival, personal revival, for yourself, for your church here at Faith Baptist Church, for Milton, and worldwide. And that we will see a change in our wonderful country that God has blessed us so with. We can do that. Let's stand to our feet. We'll be dismissed.